Bé, molt bona tarda, molt bona nit. Jo una molt breu presentació en nom del grup que coordinem aquesta activitat, que està integrat per Lourdes Viladomiu, Jordi Saba, Joan Tibau, que avui ens presenta el conferenciant, Oriol Comes, Jordi Lleonard i la Maria Carme Vidal i també la Maria Clara de Moraes, que és la que està elaborant l'informe, en nom de tots ells que hem dissenyat aquestes activitats. Avui em plau presentar molt breument, perquè no em toca a mi parlar, la tercera de les conferències. El tema ja sabeu que és producció d'aliments i sostenibilitat. Un tema important i greu. Les perspectives d'alimentar el món estan molt compromeses i, per tant, ho tenim difícil. I avui tenim una aportació molt important per part d'una persona que en Joan Tibau la presentarà, que coneix el tema i que coneix el tema a l'abast europeu. Què passa amb la carn i amb les produccions animals? Què menjarem? Què no menjarem? Quins bistecs ens tocarà menjar? Quin impacte ambiental hi haurà? I, en definitiva, si podrem posar aliments de taula per a tothom i una mica de carn de tant en tant, si no ens diuen que anirem a l'infern si ho fem. Per tant, a partir d'aquí no em correspon res més. Thank you very much. El professor Rossati ha vingut expressament per fer aquesta conferència. Repeteixo, és una persona molt autoritzada, que coneix molt el tema i que ens il·lustrarà sobre el que hem de fer per produir, per menjar, per estalviar menjar, per respectar el medi ambient, i perquè la vida segueixi, com deien les nostres àvies, amb tranquil·litat i bons aliments, que els temps avui ho posa molt difícil. Res més, moltes gràcies. Moltes gràcies, Abel, per la teva introducció. A mi m'agradaria fer una mica de glosa del que és el professor Andrea Rossati. L'Andrea es va doctorar, primer es va graduar a la Universitat de Perugia, Itàlia, i més tard va fer el màster i la tesi doctoral a la Universitat de Nebraska, als Estats Units. És una persona que ha estat sempre molt lligada amb organitzacions de genètica a nivell italià, primerament, però potser el seu paper fonamental va ser el d'impulsar el que és gran part de la Federació Europea de Zootècnia. Ell és el secretari general, des de fa molts anys, de l'Associació Europea de Zootècnia o de Ciència Animal i també de l'Associació Mundial de Producció Animal. Aquestes dues associacions apleguen el que serien la major part de les institucions científiques que estan vinculades a la producció animal del món. Ell participa també en projectes d'investigació, ell i els seus grups, en aspectes de transferència i de difusió i ha participat en molts mítings. Per exemple, un d'ells es va celebrar aquí a Barcelona l'any 2009, que era el 60è Congrés de la Federació Europea de Zootècnia, 60è, això el 2009, fa 14 anys ara, i van venir més de 1.300 assistents. Va ser un congrés molt important que va representar un canvi del rol d'aquesta associació a dintre del que és els progressos de la producció animal a Europa. En aquests moments participa en molts jornades, congressos, sessions, tant a nivell tècnic com a nivell també estratègic i polític. I crec que és una persona molt autoritzada perquè ens pugui fer una visió del que és la producció animal a Europa en aquests moments, quines són les perspectives i sobretot perquè tinguem una visió des d'Europa però des de fora d'Europa, que a vegades l'oblidem. I sense res més, m'agradaria que ell comencés la seva presentació, la farà en anglès. Més tard tractarem de fer la seva traducció d'aquestes presentacions al català, els posarem a dintre del llibre que està previst que s'editi, i espero que us plagui la seva presentació. Segur. Gràcies, Andrea. Gràcies. Thank you very much, Andrea Tobixia. So, I were waiting for your presentation. Okay? Thank you very much, Joan. And uh, I want to thank all of you who participate to this uh, meeting, who spent some of your time today discussing all this important topic. I want to especially thank Joan. He's a good old friend of mine for uh, making this possible. <clears throat> and also these institutes. It's the first time I come to this institute and I was 
Joan took me around a little bit. It's a beautiful building. I'm sorry for the people that are not here. I say at home, they could not enjoy it. It's a fantastic building and a very old architecture and wooden beams uh, is lovely. So anyway, let's go to our topic. And I apologize for not speaking Catalan, not speaking any other common language here, but English. So that's uh, if there is something that you I was not able to explain well, please uh, stop me and uh, with his help, maybe or someone else help, I, I would make it. So this is a summary so that you, you more or less know where which level we are when along our present, the presentation. And I start talking about the current situation. So <clears throat> the first point, which is the, we call sometimes, you know, the elephant in the room, the most important thing in when we discuss is that the world population now is 7.9 billion people. We plan to be 8 billion, likely 23 or 24 at the very moment. So soon we arrive, eight, we'll be 8 billion people. 7.9 billion people is really a lot of people, a lot. And we have to feed those people. And what we talk today now is the necessity of these people, how is it we, is possible, if it will be possible, to feed these people in the future. And talking about, in our case, uh, when talking about feeding people, the production of food of animal origin. First one, milk. <clears throat> the, the world milk production will grow because now we are 7.9 billion people, by 2050 we'll be more or less almost 10 billion people. That's the estimation we'll have. The, the largest increase, largest growth is in the South Asia, uh, which is not by uh, surprise. And, and it, it also, uh, we'll discuss about this many other times during this presentation, other places where it grows is Africa or Latin America, uh, Europe, Western Europe, not too many, but still it will be is still the second uh, area in terms of milk production. But overall, next 30 years will grow 35% of milk production. We have to go there. Talking about meat, this slide is even more astonishing. If you see in 1960, how much meat we produce, and then you go now, you see how much, how is it possible, how is it possible to increase so much the meat production in, uh, in the world. And if you also see, it, it increased very much in, in the level of uh, pork and especially chicken in the last years, the beef production is more or less remaining the same gross, but not at the same level. Going to the third production of uh, from animal eggs, also eggs grow a lot. It's, this is the states, the statistics of the last 20 years. You know, from 50 million tons, we arrived to more than 80 or now around 90 million tons per year. So almost double in the last 20 years. Uh, just to say again, why livestock production is important? Uh, well, first of all, we have 40% of the, the total agricultural production more or less it comes from livestock and we have 570 million people dealing in agriculture farms in the world meaning one out of 12, 12 persons in the world are working in agriculture i i don't think i had to explain you because i'm sure you know this but when i sometimes I talk with people i think agriculture is something okay it's not so important it is very important uh, not only because it feeds people but because of is a is a large part of our economy and a social activity because of this high, lar long, large production and because of so many people, we certainly create troubles. One of them is environmental impact, of which we will talk about. So how we arrive to this situation? How we arrive to the situation in which we produce so much? Well, of course, this is linked to the human necessity. There was a, a philo British philosopher, Malthus, more than 200 years ago, more, he predicted that in the short term the, the human will go to salvation human beings because uh, the human beings uh, grow geometrically and eventually the production level of feed grow not at the same level let's say arithmetically so oh, fortunately he was not right at least for a couple of hundred years <clears throat> we want to know if his prediction so negative prediction will be um, will be neglected also in the next 30 years as a matter of fact, the daily supply of calories also grow very much <clears throat> and grows wherever in the world. 
here you have the figures of the world and grows up here. That's the average from all human beings in, in, this, in this world. Uh, all continents grow, some a little more than others, like Asia, some less than others, like Africa. Also, we have, a, this is a jump, a very important jump, you see in, a, no, no, sorry, yeah, this one. If Eastern Europe, after the social changes, the early 90s, you see drop the level of calories to people and then arrive not at the same level as before, but almost. So it show very any, in any case that the level of uh, calories per person in the world go grow from 2,200 more or less to 2,700 on average, of course. And of course, we put together any kind of uh, sources of calories, could be meat, could be milk, could be uh, pulses, could be grains, whatever. In any case, if you notice, there is Africa and then Asia were the lowest and then the closest to the lower uh, continent in terms of uh, kilocalories per person. And here you see the percentage of undernourished human population by FAO, the usual countries, unfortunately to say, you know, uh, Congo, Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Sudan, sud south of Sudan, which is here is there are no data, but we know there are really a lot of people are undernourished in that country. Usually those countries are the countries in which there are not only lack of infrastructure, but also other trouble like uh, uh, dramatic uh, climatic problems like, uh, you know, dryness or, or, or drought, sorry, or wars or migrations. So <clears throat> sometimes we hear people saying that food is lost or wasted, which is the level and we need to reduce this uh, one third that is lost or wasted to solve all the problems. Unfortunately, this is not possible because some of this, well, can be reduced, but it's not possible to reduce completely out of zero percent because some of that is part of the production level. You know, when thinking that when the, the, the wheat is collected or cropped and so something is lost in the field. So for instance, no way to, to reduce to zero, but can be reduced. In any case, when you talk about uh, meat and milk, we are around 20% of what is produced, it's lost or wasted. Lost is when it's lost from the production level before right to the market, wasted when from the market to the garbage bin at home. Well, after being said that the food production is linked to the human necessity, which is sounds so obvious, but I think it was good to say again, how we arrive to increase so much the production level in terms of kilocalories per person, and considering that this increase of three, four hundred kilocalories per person in the last 60 years is also put together with a double of the population. So we said that we create a lot more food than in the past. There are, of course, due to technologies. We arrived to a situation like this was this one, and uh, which is still present in many parts of the world to this one. Which are the technologies that are, um, well, not only the technologies should be important. We, we have another slide with technologies later on, but it should be also possible to apply technologies. So bringing the European technologies, for instance, or North American technologies to the developing countries is not so easy. Because the fact that here the technology is well applied is because there are investment, because people would make investment to do this uh, technology improvement. We were chatting before with Joanne, before coming here, about a country like Israel, for instance, there's many spin off where technology really is growing and then are applied in the rest of the world, but not really in the rest of the world. Some part of the world where investments are possible, where the culture is also making it possible, because also you need to be culturally prepared to accept this technology, new technology technologies, as well as the society and infrastructure. We can produce, we can have the best uh, milk producing uh, uh, farm in, in the center of Congo, but then if we don't have the infrastructure, the roads, the refrigerator system to move this, uh, the production somewhere else or to sell it or distribute to the people, then it's certainly is not very efficient. So investment, culture, society, infrastructure, and also the technical expertise. This is something also that is lacking in the developing countries. Um, the few good students that are in those countries, as soon as they are able to, to, to be very good, they are going to look for salaries, better salaries in the developed part of the world and making a, a, their country even poorer than before. 
Well, when I thought about the applied technologies in animal production, I start to make a list. They are just random lists. Just the first one come to my mind were artificial insemination, unifeed, IT management. Certainly I miss many of them. It's just at least the first, uh, how many other seven that I got to my mind. But um, there are certainly many others. So <clears throat> how we arrive there? Now we talk about who's responsible. So we, we, we understood how we arrived to this situation. Who's responsible? I found six main actors in the livestock production. The first one, the one without whom I was not yet talking to you today, uh, the most important one are the farmers. Well, the farmers are in Europe, they are diminishing in, in, in number. Also, generally, this is a global uh, trend, but they're diminishing, but the farm size in grows, increase. So there's also a more interesting slide later on to show that if the, if the size of the farm is grows, then it's more possible to invest and the technologies can be more applied. So the farmers are very important, of course, because they make the basic food production. But the, the trend is this, diminishing the number, larger farm size, more investment and more technologies. Then researchers. The researchers live out of public support or private support. Um, both of them are important. Um, let's say it's difficult to separate, but public support is more, they might, they might do research more in blue sky thinking, more some theoretical thinking. Private usually give more support to for direct application, but it's very blended. It's not really like this. Uh, in this, the last years, we all noticed that is a diminishing of uh, support from the public and increasing from the private. So we have to be prepared for this. In the future, it's going to happen like this. It's also very important where research is done. And this is an old story again, uh, if, if we have these people coming from developing countries bring into the European University or North American University, they most of the time study the type of livestock production in our areas, not in the areas where they, they, the developing countries area. So uh, it's important where the research is done because it's linked to the territory many times. And also very important, the flow between research and industry which is, is easy if, the, if, if there are industries and there is a market to, to, for that. Talking about industries, well, they help the production, they do increase the production efficiency. Uh, they have a big impact in animal farming. Uh, we are in the green revolution, many green revolution uh, that we are, you know, we, we, we face in, this, in the last years. Uh, this grows to uh, an industry to sell uh, or to their product, they had to standardize their product. And making standardize of, of a product to sell to the farms, make a standardization of animal products. So at the end, if uh, the products in, in my country, in your country, in many other countries around the world are very similar to each other, is also because, not only because the market requires that, which we'll talk about, but also because the, the industry that have a big impact on the development of efficiency of the farms, will make standard product. Politicians, well, they, have made, they make many decisions that are important for our life and also for our activity and for livestock production. Um, the situation of last days, unfortunately, we have this tragedy and this war in the East Europe and, uh, you know, the decision of international commerce, which are, are applied and this make trouble the world, the decision to have a feed uh, enough for our animals. They are creating, there are troubles due to this. Of course, the, the war is much bigger trouble. I don't want to deny this. But there's also the secondary effects like this one. And they also give a support to animal farming, but it's becoming very selective. Uh, in the last 20 years, animal farmers is not seen anymore as the one who produce something, but is the one who had to keep the environment keep the ecology, stay in the countryside, don't come create to the city to create social troubles. So they are supported for other purposes than on also other purposes than simple production. And politicians listen, listen to their voters. And so they are thinking about animal welfare, health, environment. So something that, you know, we were not used 20, 30, 40 years ago. 
which I don't say is wrong. I think is right, but uh, it's we are some way uh, influenced by the politician decisions. Finally, for whom we produce food? For the consumers. There are dietary changes in the developing countries. The, the developing countries are moving their diet. They are going for a diet that was made out of pulses, uh, grains, or rice, uh, you know, wheat, or things like this, to animal protein. As soon as they have some uh, income, and they want to eat like the Western world uh, uh, eat already since many decades, which is nothing wrong with this. I think it's a natural trend. And, uh, but that's of course make it dietary changes in, the, in, the, in those countries. Well, just, I was in, a, in visiting Mexico in the early 90s, 30 years ago. And I remember going to the countryside, you see all these little shops selling local products. And I was fascinated by these local products, you know, produced like, you know, beans, all these uh, uh, things they are doing in Mexico. I went there to Mexico four years ago, the same area. You don't find any more of these uh, small uh, food stores. You find a supermarket like in USA. And you find uh, something I can find also at home. Not always, but always. All, all the so there is changes. The market is going and the dietary changes, the dietary requirement of people is changing. It changed also in developed countries. We tend to eat a little bit less uh, meat. We tend to drink less milk. Um, cheese is more or less the same level. But these changes in developing part of the world, in develop, developed part of the world, make changing the livestock production systems and what we produce as, as an animal product. Also, the increase of human population uh, has had a big, big impact. You remember I say the elephant in the room, you know, this is 7.9 billion people that want to eat every day, need to eat every day. And finally, the sixth actor is the civil society. They are not thinking only anymore about receiving food. They still think that food is a strategic value, but they think about environmental, animal welfare, ethical aspects. I often have friends who are vegans or vegetarians. I don't agree, of course, but the reason, uh, the main reason is not really healthy the reason. They say it's ethical reason, which we give full respect to this. Why not? So there is ethical aspects. They're not a large population, but still there is some, some of them. So we discuss about who's responsible. Now, talking about the European system, livestock production. Livestock production in the European Union is a large economic sector. If in the world the production livestock in the agricultural field was 40%, more or less, in Europe is 45%. We are talking about 168 billion annually in the European Union for products of animal origin and generate jobs for almost 30 million people. Um, everyone, not only in the producing, but also in the, in the processing centers, the selling, everyone else. Foreign production is more, this is what I wanted to, I put this in between bracket because I thought it was interesting, I want to forget to tell you, is more in dairy than in pig and chicken. Uh, because it's, in dairy, is, is, the mechanization is less possible, while in pig production and chicken production is more possible. And so that's another reason, and also including the fact that the efficiency of meat production, protein production, pig and poultry is higher than in beef or in, in dairy cow for milk, then the, this pig and poultry production boomed the last years. Something that is typical of Europe, which most of the times is something that is beneficial for life, our livestock industry compared to the rest of the world. One thing is the vicinity to technology development. You remember I say research is important where we, where we do it. And then the short application chain from research to industry to farmers. It's very short. Many times up in the same area. I'm from Italy, in the Po Valley, we have a lot of research, a lot of industry, a lot of farmers. And I'm sure it's the same here in Catalonia and, or in Brittany, in France, or something like this. Huh? There is a cultural background, which is higher. We know to, to have this uh, implemented in a livestock farm, then you need to have a, you know, have a good cultural background to understand it. And the ability to, to invest in development. Also, the vicinity to rich market. 
a market are rich, are richer than other parts of the world. In Europe, the market is rich. If you produce the same amount of, the, of milk or meat in, in a poor country, you get less money, you have less money to invest for the development. But on the other side, we have a higher labor cost and um, compared to the developing world. And we go to the university, to research centers. Just recently, I think a month ago, came out the annual rank of agricultural university in the world. And uh, I think for the seventh years in a, in a row, Wageningen University in the Netherlands is the number one for the seventh year in a row. It's a really top university. But there are the three universities that are in the top six. Uh, another one is the uh, SLU, um, Uppsala University in Sweden. Another one is a Zurich Polytechnic in Switzerland. Another one is an NMBU in Norway. You know, yeah. So it's, and then we have many other good universities around Europe, but these are the top ones. But so the European University are really on the top of the world. Four out of six uh, are from Europe. Um, also, there are many research agricultural centers linked to the regional government and national government. Uh, I'm thinking of the best example we have in Europe, which is in Rye, in Rye now in France. There are 10,000 people working for the Institute of Research of uh, Agronomic Research and, and Environment now. Uh, so this is also the, the research level in Europe is certainly very good, but it's not so homogeneous around the continent. I don't want to name because it's not polite to name, but some part of Europe is not so much advanced as other part of Europe. Some way, the EU framework project um, programs help very much of uh, dissemination of science and uh, creating an, a European network. And that was a fantastic invention. Someone did, I think, in the 80s of the last century. There is still some minor shortcomings, and I, I as an EAP, I can see this, and that uh, I think is, a, is positive. 90% of this is very positive. There is still a 10% that they need to be improved. The fact that there is some university, some research area, some area is rarely included in the EU projects. So we have like a, um, a dictatorship of uh, research from some area, and which is everyone complain. And uh, I still don't find a solution to this problem. Still, it's a fantastic opportunity that everyone has. We in EAP, we participate in 23, 24 projects, so we, we work on that uh, constantly. But, um, and, and we, thought, we know how important it is. We were chatting before with Juan Pablo, we, we discovered we were uh, meeting before in a new project we participate together, which is named GeneSwitch, let's mention it. Okay, livestock of production in Europe. Not only the research is different around Europe, but also where, where animal production is included. Here you see the, the, the in dark green, the area where there's more production, which is a livestock unit per hectare. And uh, you see Catalonia is one of that, and uh, Brittany, and the Po Valley in Italy, and then the area between uh, the Netherlands and um, Belgium and uh, Northwest Germany and somewhere in Austria and Bavaria in Denmark and Ireland. So these are the area where these more and Cyprus, surprisingly. Brittany, yes. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> that's about where is more research and where is more in Europe and where is more livestock productions. Let's talk about the evolution of consum consumption of animal products per person in Europe. If we make 100, the per consumption in 1980, let's see what happened in 2010, which is the most updated we have. So in 30 years, we can easily see that poultry is the one that almost doubled. So the consumption of poultry in 30 years almost doubled. Fish also grow very much. And that's all due to aquaculture. Certainly. <clears throat> and uh, pig and dairy grow a little bit. Eggs, mm, more or less the same. Sheep and beef decrease consumption per person in Europe. Eh? It's more or less what happened in, 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 at the global level. Eh? It's not so much different. There are differences in different areas in the world, but this trend, we saw it, you remember, when, when in, in one of the previous slides. 
this is complicated slides, but just to show use of milk in European Union, when sometimes you say we export milk, we import milk, it's a very low amount. Yeah, you see it's 0 0.4 and 0 is imported and 0 0.1 is exported. Uh, so it's um, really not too much. What is uh, the, what happens to milk? 30, so out to 160, which is uh, less, less than 20% is on drinking milk. The rest is in cheese, butter, milk powder, and wheat. And most of the milk produced in Europe is cow's milk. Okay, we both come from your Mediterranean countries mm -hmm. and uh, where used milk is also important. Yeah. Um, but uh, the majority comes of goat as well, yes. The majority is still cow's milk. So, we go to the next one. Current forces. Why we arrive here, we know it. The European situation. Not equal increase of human population among world area, old areas. So, the increase of human population is not the same in, 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 the same, in different areas. Again, this is a scary slide. Eh? This is very scary. You see here where we start in 1950, Asia was 1.4 billion, Europe was uh, half a billion, and the other continent were very low. Before the year 2000, Africa had more people than in Europe. And now we are here. And this is the trend. So at the end, you would see that there is a grow in Latin America and Caribbean, um, North America, Oceania, but really negligible. The important grow is in Asia. We are right to the top of 5.3 5 billion people to then decrease. And then Africa is following. Africa is going to have the same population of, uh, of Asia in maybe 100 years. But as my old regression analysis professor used to tell me, when you make regression so distant from the data you collect, it's just fantasy. So maybe it's not fantasy, maybe it's a trend we have to consider, but nevertheless, most of the estimation for 2050 are very similar to what we see here. Very similar. And if you see, sorry, if you see the number of young people, if I am not remember wrong, I read this information some months ago, the number of people in Nigeria younger than 18 years old is the same number of people that are older than 18 years old. So there's a lot of young people that come from these areas. What about the European population? Well, European population, currently we are at this level, 750 something, 67 more or less, is tend to stay, be stable, then slightly decrease. This is the best estimation. These dot lines are the 80% 80 predicted interval and 95% predicted interval. This one, uh, if we have plus 0 0.5 child, child per lady, and a female, and minus 0 0.5 child female per female. So that, you see how it changes very much, having one half a child more or half a child less, eh? change a lot. It was just to give an example. But we are going to decrease. Um, we know this already. And I, I, again, I know, sorry, my, the figures of my country more than of others, when we don't talk about animals, we, if we didn't have the immigrant, immigrants, our population will be decreasing now. Uh, we, we are at the same level, grow a little bit because of immigrants, but I think it's normal in many other European countries. So, the increase of uh, human population among world areas is different. Uh, there is, the, there is an increase of animal products in developing countries because the market requires, because the more technologies also slowly, slowly is applied and uh, because the people are growing in number. So the markets require that. There is also social, traditional, environmental aspects that are modifying. When we talk about animal farm, farming, we talk about agriculture. We know that there is nothing more linked to the earth, to the land than agriculture. So the social, the tradition in agriculture are very strong, much stronger than any other economic aspect or social aspect. There are new technologies that are is a force that to increase the production in different level, areas of the world. And there is a relative large application, larger than it used to be before. There is an increase of international commerce. 
I realized recently that most of the pig produced in Denmark go to China. Yeah. And, Spain. and Spain too, yeah. I think Spain is the largest producer of pig in Europe now. And because of this international commerce, uh, there will be a standardization of markets. The example of Mexico, personal example of Mexico I told you before, or the example I gave about the standardization of techno applied technolo technologies that cause a standardization of animal products. So how could we answer to the request we had in the future to increase food? This is what happened in the past. In the past, we start to have, we increase food from 1500 up to 1900, basically only to have more land to farm, to increase the land to farm. Then more or less around 100, 120 years ago with the second agricultural revolution, by the way, is this, the, the intensification, the technology supply grow very much. And then we have to handle with the demand management, which is also something that is hopefully happened, but it's not so easy to do. So more land, then more technology, and then management of what we had. Those were the forces, constraints, again, environment. Well, greenhouse gas emission, everyone is talking about this. No one knows about these figures. We have a lot of polemics. We have people say it's much less, people say much more. Personally say that I think that the, you know, the heating, the cars, uh, make really much more trouble than us. And I believe everyone can stay without a car, but not one can stay without eating. So we have to think also uh, this aspect. But um, the agricultural production, sorry, let me say something populistic here, is very weak in terms of uh, representing the importance of this sector to the rest of the world. The people producing gasoline are much stronger than us, so they're pointing the finger to someone else, and we are the weakest part of the society, and so then we have to stand this. Anyway, 14.5% is what more or less people are thinking, but they say someone say more, someone is say less. There are many ways to, to number, to measure this, this figure. Where it comes from? Well, it comes from a feed production or animal and all li direct livestock production and sometimes for you know, transport and processing. The largest part, if we go to species, is a beef, 2.9 gigatons per year. Then milk, 1.4, and then we have buffalo and small ruminants uh, production. Also some pig meat, chicken meat, but relatively less than uh, beef. <clears throat> so what to say, beef is the guilty guy, is the person that we are, everyone is pointing the finger on it, is a, is a beef production. And um, as a matter of fact, uh, it's not only for environment, but probably, likely for other reasons, is, is the, 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 the consumption in Europe is diminishing, of this, as we saw before. I was coming here with the Joan, we discussed a little bit about this presentation, and I told him, this is the slide that probably scares me more. This is the, the growth in greenhouse gas emission from meat production in uh, uh, North America, which are right here, in Europe is the, the green line, in Africa, the orange one, line, the Latin America, the black one, in Asia, the blue one. Now, the growth that we will have will become mainly from Africa, but still, Latin America and even more Asia are those who produce more greenhouse gases. Overall, in Europe, we are on the steady level, if not even diminishing. The green, the red, the green line. So I'm very happy that European Union make many new strategy to diminishing greenhouse gases because we are in this planet and we want to protect the planet and to give possibility to our children and grandchildren to keep grow, living in this, in this planet. But sometimes we forget to say that we are not the, the most important, the guilty guys here. Um, other continents are more guilty than us. I understand that in those continents it's more difficult to apply a reduction of greenhouse gases, which is certainly impossible to do in many aspects. But I think we have to consider this point, that uh, we are um, solving the small problem because we are this is the place where we can solve it. But the larger problem is where we cannot act, because this is what happened. 
And in Africa, you see, it's growing, it's planned to grow. Okay, mm, good part of the Latin America beef production comes to Europe or come to North America. So, okay, they produce greenhouse gas, but it comes from us. So secondary, we are responsible for that as well. But this is not a game between Africa, Europe, Asia. We are in the same global world and we have to do everything, something. So I'm glad that Europe is pulling the other continents say, okay, we are doing this, now it's about your time to do it. But that's also what we have to, to do, to ask to those people to act somewhere. So environment, lack of feed of animal consumption. This is also um, another issue that is a constraint of increasing the animal production. One is environment, is a lack of feed. In many countries, especially in developing countries, where it is more necessary to have animal products, the feed is in competition with animal, with the human feed, the food. Uh, think about maize, corn in India. No, there is a competition between giving to the animals or give, oh, uh, giving to people. Other sort of constraints, social aspects like animal welfare, the vegans, the vegetarians, we talked before, the, there's um, animal protection groups and, um, and also the image of animals in the human society. Uh, did you notice that in the butchery, there's not anymore the figures of animals? Because people want to see the steak, they don't want to see the animal when it comes from. And, uh, and because we think, you know, the, we have to treat cattle, horses, pigs, chicken, like our cats and dogs at home. And, um, and when we show a slaughterhouse, which is not a nice place to be, but it's necessary, and to human society they got horrified. So the image of animals in human society has a big impact on the consumption, but even more in the political politicians' decisions. And then, then there is constraint to technology application. Technology cannot be applied everywhere at the same level as we say before. So the future, what we could expect? There is not a unique answer. The future in the world and in Europe. As we say, the human population now is 7-9 billion, it will be 9.5 and maybe even more in less than 30 years. The European population is 725, maybe grow, uh, will, will be 725, now it's 745, so more or less it remains stable. Um, there will be a larger demand of animal products and to satisfy the request, which is not only for calories, but also for you know, the, the, the taste, the, the social sign of eating meat or drinking milk or eating cheese that in developing countries exist. And the European animal production will remain stable, although improving the efficiency, as we think it will, will diminish the number of animals. It happens already. Now we produce as more or less the same amount of milk as in the past with less animals. And what we want as a scientist, but also as a European citizen, and the European continue to have a leading role in the world of technology development to improve efficiency and also to guide the world to that um, environmental respect or welfare respect that currently is more very well respected in Europe, not so much in other continent, not at all in other continent again. At the end of the day, the world we must produce more meat, milk, eggs, uh, with higher quality standards, lower cost, so that everyone can afford it, having a decreasing in environmental impact. Um, respecting a social aspect, a social willingness. But at the end of the day, we have to have economic efficient farms, because if we do all these constraints and the farmers are not economic efficient, they stop to make farm, to produce animal and to have animals and produce animal product. Consumption of animal products in current developing countries will increase. In Europe, we say we remain stable in general. Different. Europe is a large, it's not a large continent, but it's like 745 million people, so it's not the same everywhere. Um, the consumption of animal products will grow, especially or mainly because they grow the de developing countries' consumption. So we have different situations for in different areas. When I was asked by Joan, so what do you think about talking this topic? I thought this is a huge topic and we have because every different area has different answers, many different answers. Think about the species, areas uh, that, you know, we can talk for days, but 
Fortunately, it will not be for this. <laughs> there are different products for animal farming area. One of the things that we noticed in the last decades is the urbanization. So urban areas, urbanization rate, uh, about 10 years ago, more or less, the number of people living in the cities bypass um, became more than uh, people living in the rural areas. What this caused? If you have more people living in the cities and less people living in, in the rural area. This is a, a map where you can see in dark blue where the people live mainly more in the cities, which is obviously are the countries there, huge countries where many areas are desert or not usable, like could be Australia or Siberia for Russia or Amazon forest for Brazil. So if you have it in urban areas, with more people living in urban areas, we have people less linked to the agricultural production. So they, are, they want to eat or they are ready to eat more processed food, not, you know, original food. Uh, they are, they have a society, they create a society awareness that farmers don't see it like animal, you know, protection, all these things. But on the other side, if people move to urban areas, we create more marginal areas, more marginal land. I used to walk in the, in the, in the weekends in the mountains. I'm from the Appennine mountains, this in the center of Italy. I used to walk with my dog in the weekends to enjoy the, the mountains and I see them 1200, 1400 meters on the sea level where I don't know how they can produce something, but I can still see sign that maybe 50, 60 years ago, people were producing wheat or barley somewhere there. Now there is pasture. Maybe you see some beef cattle, some canina cattle, some horses, but uh, not anymore. And I, I thought, how could people make something out of living here in this very difficult environment? Those people probably after the second world left, I'm talking about my place, but I'm sure it's the same was here in other part of Europe. After the second world left, I went to Rome, to Florence, to live in the large cities around my area. And so there are more marginal areas for animal production. And this is happening also in developing countries. But if we think this is a solution, then we are wrong. Here you have the arable land in developing countries. You see how it grows from 1960 to now, and now it will grow in 2050. So it grows the arable land in developing countries. But the human population, those who consume animal products, is also growing much faster. So the per capita arable land in developing countries is decreasing. So the, num the, the land that we can use more because people move to the cities is growing, but the number of people is growing much faster. So the arable land per person is decreasing. So then what else? Okay, let's talk about different market. Milk, production increase. Next 10 years, we think about more than 300 million tons. More 54% per farm because the farms diminish the numbers. In numbers, increase the size. And there will be less than 100 million, more or less 100 million farms making milk in the world. Milk consumption increase in the next 10 years on average of 16% per, per, per person. As we say, not in Europe, but in, develop, in the other part of the world, meaning in the developing country. The, the areas that are producing more milk are remain exporting countries like Euro, Euro, EU, sorry, New Zealand, USA, remain. But the, the country has more potentiality to grow is Asia, South Asia, actually with a potential increase by 50% in 2030 of milk production. Next on the list is Africa, with 30% growth. But we notice how much the human population will grow in that area. So I don't think they will export, export because they have to consume locally. The exportation remains the, the, the usual camp areas like USA, Europe. Europe will supply 35% of the total meat production in 2030. And, um, but the, the difference in Europe and other places, including USA, is that there is more added value products. If you remember the, the difficult graph I showed you before about the use of milk, um, most of the milk produced in Europe is going to produce cheese, butter, 
so processed uh, product which has a, have an added value to the to the milk yeah? so the market of the european union will need more milk in the future to satisfy the growth but not for liquid milk as i say for the but for the product um, the milk production will see a modest increase uh, from 2018 to 2030 on less than one percent per year also the individual milk yield per cow i didn't put per cow here should also increase by 14 percent in 2030 which is I'm surprised when I see the, the average. I mean, when I was studying, the average production of uh, when I was a student many years ago now, uh, the per cow was lactation, 305 days per lactation was uh, 65, 70, 100 kilograms per lactation. Now the av national average is 100 million, 100, uh, sorry, uh, one, 10,000 milk production per lactation. So it's and it will keep growing. So about the meat, let's see what happened. This is production and consumption. The blue one is a poultry, then the green one is a pork, then we have beef, which is gray, and sheep is the orange. This is the world level. Then we go here in the low income countries, they produce less than the what they consume. Low middle income countries, again, they produce less than they consume. Upper middle income countries, they, they produce more than they consume. So those are the exporting countries. The high income countries, more or less, are the same level. They, can, they don't export very much. If I can say these are mainly South America and Latin America, or Australia yeah, countries. And these are Asian or African. And this is the same figures, but in percentage. So, but talking about meat, the milk production in 2030, so in less than 10 years, will increase to reach 330 million tons. In Europe, the countries that will have a larger increase in the next 10 years are the countries where labor costs are lower. And there is probably even more land, Poland, Hungary, Romania. Um, as everywhere else in the world, the poultry and pigs will have a larger increase in Europe too. About eggs, the production of eggs worldwide, also, and we saw before, just the beginning of this presentation, the, the figures, is almost 90 million, um, million uh, tons in 2020, up to 74 in 2016. So it's growing even that very much. The global egg production volume is increased by 100% since 1990. Sometimes I wonder about the statistics to tell you. I'm showing you statistics. I should be the first one to believe it. But we remember our grandmothers having maybe chicken, some of them producing eggs. They probably didn't belong to statistics, but they were producing chicken and eggs and eating eggs. So these are statistics mainly come from the industrial production. European Union is the second largest producer of eggs. Sorry, but anyway, this is a good, maybe if it's not 100% since 1990, it's low, less 100%, but still there is a big increase. China is the biggest producer in the world of eggs. Europe is come right after. But in Europe, we have new challenges. High feed cost, higher than probably other parts of the world. And then we have more stringent food requirement. Yeah. Try to close it. Uh, consumer demands of high quality products. And uh, also we have an interest in animal welfare, which is not so much in other parts of the world. At the end, when we say well, we put all these things together, food production, farmers, civil society, industries, at the end is the economy who is the guiding role. So if the farmers have a good economy, they will continue to produce. If the processing center have a good economy, they will continue to process. And so far, back to the, to the consumer. So we have to keep an eye to always to economy. We cannot play games because otherwise there will not be any game anymore. Conclusions. So try to conclude there are some slides to, to summarize what i say before and to pull up some good ideas i hope so um, the analysis as we say before is more correct for geographical areas than than for the whole globe uh, sub-saharan countries will remain important as a list of feet with that, that increase of human population with the limited constraints of increasing the production 
certainly will remain important, net importers. In other areas where, like the Americas and Australia, the size of the companies is growing very much. Uh, in, your, in USA, it's normal to see dairy milk with a dairy farm with more than 1,000 cows. It's very common. Here, there is some in Europe, but not so common as in North America. And then, of course, the mechanization is increasing at this level. Some other places, again, sub-Saharan Africa, there is lacking of investment and, uh, and, uh, and less efficient, of course. In Europe, there is intensification and specialization. High labor costs will remain, but it's possible to invest. Low price of, for livestock products um, compared to the high price of other goods. Uh, there is an influence of the common agricultural policy and the Green Revolution, which I don't, I don't have time to discuss now too much. Sorry about this, but it will have an influence very much. Uh, then we have a public objectives like, uh, as I said before, not only production, but environmental, welfare, rural development, biodiversity. And of course, we take care of the retailers and the consumers, influence the production. Okay, this is something I, I told you before. This is the number of farms, dairy farms in Europe. You see, from 1980 to 2020 more almost. And this is the size, in terms of her size. On average, 20 cows, now on average, 100 cows. So can you imagine how much changes there were in the last 50, 40 years? In Latin America, there is an equal access to land and natural resources. There are large states. 1% of the companies in South America have 50% of the area. The rest is small family farms. So there is efficiency of large states in meat production, mainly. Um, the low, low labor costs facilitate the, the production of poultry and also pork. China and Southeast Asia is more about growing companies. Also, they are trying to do what the Western part of the world is doing, increase the livestock production, but they also increase the cost of production because labor cost is growing. Um, and more, in this area, more than in other day, there is an increase in poultry and pig production. South Asia, it's a strange situation. I was I read this twice because I was very I, I, I know I was not I'm not so familiar with the Indian situ situation, but I found out in India since the last thirty years the farms over ten hectares diminished from nine percent to four point five percent. So there is a the, the rest of the world the size of the farm is growing in India is decreasing. It's a social aspect. I realized talking with some people, I asked why, and they told me but I didn't read in any paper, just personal information, that the, the growth in human population, instead to, um, to, to have a larger farm size to, to feed these people, they, they split their land properties in different, just to give something to survive to every small family, to every family. Of course, there is a little possibility of applying new technology in this situation. And, um, and also, it's, it's very fragile in terms of climate change. Think about the monsoons. The India lives out of the monsoons uh, rhythm, eh? and it didn't change so far. But if it happens, it will be a disaster. So there is a, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, there is a human pressure, animal disease, climate changes. There are many situations that make the production system very fragile. There are different solutions to every one of them, every one of these problems, but depends on the, on the places. So the places exporting animal products as Europe are often economically rich area and high, high labor cost. Production per employed is influenced by possibility of finding jobs outside of animal husbandry because there is an economic development. More people, more animal products are necessary. Agricultural products will have an increase by 70% in 2050. There is an, a, a, a nice paper last July came out in Nature a guy making meta-analysis on 57, if I'm not wrong, 57 papers mm -hmm. estimating what, how much agricultural production will be in 2050 and the average is by 70%. Um, there are less breeders in the world. Um, this is a trend. USA 100 years ago where 41% of the people were farmers, now it's 2%. The farmers are growing also close to urban areas because that is, that is where the market is greater efficiency. Well, we discussed about the farming revolution, 
how it comes uh, to increase this technology, the latest technology, precision license farming, especially in Europe and North America, also in Brazil and China, the genomic revolution in genetic improvement of animals, and also the more standardized production. Can Europe be, Europe be considered as a model for the rest of the world? I don't think so, because we have guidelines for Europe, for the, our situation, but we can apply the same guidelines in Africa, South Asia, or other part of the world. This is a typical mistake was done many years ago and uh, producing um, what we call cathedrals in the desert, which don't work. European challenges, I go fast this because I see Joan getting nervous. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I know I to go fast that. Yeah, but yeah, to digest a little bit, you're right. Okay, let's go to environmental and health. We discussed this many other ways. Animal product consumption, we say also this many times, increased consumption of your base proteins, both in rich and developing countries. And the final slide and the conclusion, which I say with a global demand of a very sharp increase in animal products and the constraints associated with this environment, uh, welfare, climate change, all these problems. The possibility of maintaining the environment as it is today and at the same time satisfying the global dem demand of animal products is certainly very limited. And the only thing I think is that the only solution is to improve the technology, to improve research, to speed up the research, to, do some, to find better solution. Although I think that despite the efforts of the research, the industrial economic world, both now and the future, prefer not to change in order to find long terms and not interesting solution. If we remember one of the slides before, public support in research is diminishing, private support is growing, and the private need to have a return in a short, mid-term, not in long term. And this is something to work in the long term. And, and if we diminish the public support, then the long term solution will be more difficult to be found. Thank you very much. I think, uh, I think it's quite interesting to see that we are older, we are small, and we don't grow. So we need uh, to look outside to see what happens with our system of production. Mm -hmm. I would like to, to ask you, uh, before there appear some questions from outside, I suppose, mm -hmm. about your opinion on these uh, new uh, ways to provide with uh, protein in the world. First of all, uh, all these uh, changes in uh, vegan uh, meat, uh, uh, artificial milk, artificial meat. meat. And did you think this uh, will help the reduction of the uh, scarcity of food in the world? Or this well, is just one uh, new uh, fashion uh, way to look at the situation? Well, I think you, you, you gave part of the answer already. I mean, it's a many ways is a fashion, but let's go a little bit more in details. You ask about vegan and vegetarians first, and I think that there is a growing number of people being vegan yeah, and vegetarians, so. but where? In Europe, North America, if um, other people in other parts of the world, they don't even think about that. Mm -hmm. It's something that culture happens to be here. I'm not judging, but I say is is here, yeah. and is not where we will have the larger demand of animal products, which is uh, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Africa, and maybe also Latin America. Yeah. So the, the the impact of vegan and vegetarian is very limited. And I was mentioning this before during the presentation, and reading, preparing this presentation, I read many other papers, and I found out that in China, I talked to you before this story. In China, the last 60 years, 60 years, yeah. the animal product, the protein of animal origin, grows nine times nine per times. person, not double, not 50% more, times diet. nine. So they change completely diet, and there are 1.3 billion people in, in growing. Mm -hmm. So if you have uh, three, four, five million vegans in Europe, it will not make any impact. Okay. This is first thing. 
When then you say about artificial meat, I'm my personal impression is that probably it's not will be maybe something, but I don't know. I don't know too much. I follow. We have organized a webinar in last February yeah, yeah. on this with my good friend and colleague Jean Francois Oquet. He's yeah. an expert on this, um, but I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I personally, my personal feeling is will not be a, also have a big impact on this aspect. I trust more in the other sources of protein to feed the animals, mm -hmm. like insects, for instance. Yeah. Insect is the insect industry is growing incredibly. In the last 10, 15 years, the industry. Uh, are growing in um, farm are growing very much and um, I don't know what impact they have but they lead me to be more optimistic that we can find protein to feed animals to, to, feed, mean, animals. to feed animals at without spending too much energy without many environmental impact and mm -hmm. without even in a small no area. area yeah, yeah. that's a, it'll be more solid as a production for the um, vegans vegetarian not at all meat I don't know too much. In addition, there is some uh, healthy concerns about uh, veganism, uh, extreme veganism. No? Yeah, yeah, it's, there are healthy concerns. Mm -hmm. But our grandparents, uh, mm -hmm. when uh, they finally were not so poor anymore, they, 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 they show around the world that they were not so poor anymore because they were able to eat meat every day. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because their parents, they could not. Yeah. Now we are in the same situation happening in the many developing countries. As, as soon as they have some money, they okay. want to live like a Western part of the world. Yeah. And the first thing is to have the same diet. Hamburger in McDonald's, yeah. milk, cheese. Mm -hmm. So how do you tell them now? Sorry, you have to become vegan now. No. Does it work? Okay. So I will try to find the result. Yes, please. <laughs> You, uh, thank you for the presentation. There, one, one aspect that is also interesting, that, uh, in the sensing factor that, that influences decisions of people, are those reports on health. So, uh, the, on uh, red meat consumption having uh, an important uh, uh, effect on, on, on health. No? So, I mean, this is also a factor, especially in Europe, in the States. I, I agree with you that, of course, uh, people, I mean, we have seen that in China, that as soon as they have some money, they try to be like the American ones. But also, at the same time, we know that for production, uh, for the, the kind of uh, resources, that meat production, as in the States, is done. I mean, it's impossible to reach the same level for all the people in the world, as you can say. So, yeah. number one, environmental impact is an important yes. factor. And then health impact. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean... The, also land resources, there are not enough land. No, but I mean, efficiency, it is, mm -hmm. it is, uh, it is different, no? I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, it is also health concerns have an impact in all this situation especially in developing countries it, it, it will be uh, currently i don't see very much uh, but it certainly will be um, another thing that is uh, is growing with um, i mean the concern the health concern that you say which i i fully agree 100 percent it comes with the culture uh, you notice this is happening in the countries that have the cultural level is general on average a little bit higher when also these countries will reach the same cultural level, and I'm not talking about knowing mathematics, I'm talking about cultural level, you understand me, then probably there will be uh, an impact on this, health, on this health effect. Eh? Um, even in our countries, the poorer past, the poorer part of the, of the countries are the where you have more fat kids. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's because it's, the, it's not the, the poor, it's because, because everyone can afford to buy in McDonald's. Eh? Yeah. But it's because there is not enough culture to understand that if you give, feed the kids with a McDonald's every day, it becomes like a bowl. Eh? So this is, this is something that uh, it comes with a culture. And, uh, but I'm very happy also that there is a growth in, in a fish uh, product, yeah. because as we know, this is healthier. And overall, also the poultry is healthier than red meat. So this, this is don't think comes for culture because because but because it's cheaper and it's more affordable. But uh, I think it comes with culture. Not now, 
but here we go. In, everyone knows, at least when we are in a certain age, that the cultural changes are slow. They will arrive, but it takes years, years, and years. There is another question here. Please. Just a quick question. Please. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Malthus in the beginning of your talk, but nobody cares about Malthus, no? It's because about of what? Malthus, Robert Malthus. Ah, Malthus. yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so the population is growing and the planet, I'm gonna, we're sure that it's not going to hold all these people in, in a <laughs> few years. No? So going to a particular question uh, in terms of animal proteins, and according to your data, we agree that we have to switch to poultry because it's uh, the less production has of, of uh, GAG yeah. emissions and in, in the middle of this such a energetic transition and decarbonization, this is clear and right? we need less space and probably we don't care too much about the welfare of the animal welfare. Mm -hmm. This is the, another, another problem, no? And overall, a comment at, at the end of your presentation in terms of eco economy, so now the small farmers in this country cannot survive if you have uh, less than 50 or 100 uh, cows. No? Yeah, yeah. So, and this is something that it's a, a big economic decision that uh, either you, you help the small farmers or you switch to particular huge farmers and, and you decide the prices of the milk, for example. No? I go immediately to this one. There was a, a Agenda 2000, some of you might remember, that was made by an commi agriculture commissioner. He was Austrian, I forgot his name, 25 years ago. Agenda 2000 was about how we plan to be agriculture in year 2000. And he was the first one, he was very, you know, looking forward, uh, the first one to say that the farmers are not anymore producers of food, but they are environmental keeping and social keeping, as I say, mentioned this before, keeping the land in the countryside so they don't come to be um, uh, unemployed people in the cities and creating social troubles. So this is, that's why I think we need to support those people in Europe. I think in Europe we can afford it. We need to support those people living in the, in the mountains, even with 20 animals, with 25 animals, but they keep the environment, they stay there, they, and Whatever other people say, if there are animals, the environment is much better, it's much well kept, much more produced. Of course, if you think about the intensive system, no, it's different. But when we think about these people in the emerging lands, I would, I would really support the, this area. So, and about chicken, yes, it, it, it is going. Maybe in the future, who knows? In ten years, we uh, chicken and, and pig will be the normal meat and. Uh, when we want to do something strange, we and, and luxury, we have a beef and a steak, like we do now with oysters or champagne, whatever. It was in Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah, exactly. In the country yeah. was not beef. Eh? No. It was uh, poultry and beef and pig. Or lamb. Or lamb. Yeah. Why well, is Japan not have the beef? So yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. They don't have. Yeah, they don't have rooms. Till now, you, you don't use the the, the word uh, fire. The agriculture and uh, uh, animal, extensive animal production, is helping to maintain the oh, forest yes. clean to clean the and forest. the surrounds too, and they avoid the problems of deforestation in one part, yeah. in another part, uh, avoiding the risk of, yeah. of, of clean of fire. shrubs. Yeah, is, I think it's very important to take in account. Yeah. I prefer to pay farmers than uh, bombes. The, uh, yeah, the, the, firemen. Yes, firemen. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but is there some questions here? Can you read that? Okay, I can read the first you one. You from mentioned uh, the vegan vegetarian is low. However, in the social media, they are very effective to influence the society view of your production system. What should we do? Yeah, this is a question coming from Maria Devant. Maria Devant, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's, a, uh, yeah it's, a, it's an interesting question. Very good. Thank you, Maria. Because this is one of the weakness that we have. Uh, the weakness comes from the fact that um, we are not good in, uh, in, in, in say what we do. Um, how can I explain this better? I said before in several slides that we are, um, the, the people feel that the animals are like humans. People, most of the people living in the cities think that uh, the cows, pigs and, and uh, poultry, they should be treated like their cats and dogs. That for mm -hmm. many people is like uh, having a, a child in the, in the house. And this humanization of animals and um, create many ethical reasons when people go to eat things, things. Uh, and we think, they think that we are negative. And this is also very bad because politicians listen to the people. Most of the people think like this. 
and they create many constraints in, in animal farming, but even worse, at least in our field, uh, less funds for research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's practically no, research, no funds for research for animal products, for animal production. We try to catch here and there for environmental keeping things like for, that, for but, not, but not specifically for that, because we are guilty in front of the society. Mm -hmm. We are not able to disseminate properly. The point is that uh, I think as animal scientists or any, as animal producers, we, don't, we are not able to disseminate to show that without animal products, there's no control of the fires in the, in the woods. There is not uh, people kept in the mountains uh, and taking care of the environment. And there is not animal proteins. So without the work of the animal, uh, the, uh, the farmers making animal products, there is no uh, there's food no security. If you, there is no food no. security, and this is here in Europe. But if when I when I have some of these people ask, asking to me, are you we treat animal very bad in Europe or like that? Okay, say so why do you want to be treated? For instance, you ask this question. Oh, you know, India like uh, like the uh, holy cows like, or yeah. something like this. But they don't understand that these animals are, we show in a slide before, producing more ga greenhouse gas than everyone else. So we take care of them, but they are extremely polluting. It's not the point of the, the, it's not the fault of the person asking this tough question. It's the fact that we are not able to tell them in the right way the answer. So it's our fault. We don't disseminate properly to civil society. We, disseminate, we are very happy to disseminate among scientists, among farmers, among the producers, but not to, to the civil society, because otherwise I feel they, under, they will understand the importance of the job of the of animal producer. In addition, there is, there is a lot of, of, of uh, sorry, in addition, there is a lot of uh, uh, wild uh, ruminants in the world. Oh, yeah. So yeah. these animals are producing also yeah. this impact. So uh, no one talk about uh, no one to disappear about the, zebra, that, yeah. the zebras in the Africa. No? <laughs> no, hopefully not. Okay. Hopefully Go to not. the next question. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. You want to read this, uh, Francesc Pifferrer? Thank you very much, Alexander. It's been about producing one kilo of farm fish is more environmental friendly than producing one kilogram of cow or chicken. Should we then encourage the production of any more quality products? How do you see increasing contribution of cow? Well, the first point is different. Is a different market, but I'm very happy if we can, uh, you know. Uh, increase the production of aquaculture is we say before is healthier and actually increase the fact that is environmental more friendly i'm not really sure i'm not an expert but i know it's creating a lot of uh, environmental problem in the sea the aquaculture also welfare is not so nice uh, for fish in the cage uh, so it's not so it's not so 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 different from the other kind of animal products but still i would encourage also for the healthy side of uh, eating fish how do you increase in contribution aquaculture i see very well because the you know um, uh, fishing is now is creating okay. trouble it's decreasing yeah. everywhere so it's a way to keep the environment in order to keep the fishes from disappearing from our mediterranean sea for instance yeah okay. i think there is a last question so that, uh, thank you, do you think the increase of vegetarians and plants-based products could affect the availability of vegetables for feed? For feed? No, no, I don't think it's such a limited scale that will not create an impact, I think. Okay. Did you think uh, you saw this? Uh, we finish at this moment, it's quite late, and uh, but I want to say thank you very much eh, to Andrea. Eh? Thank you very much. So I will to collect all of the presentation and try to, to make a short uh, uh, article on your views about. Thank, thank you, you Joanne. Thank you for this, for the people to...